Hello everyone! So I made this website where you can play two-player chess. Right now it's white's turn, so I'll click on a white piece, maybe this knight. And then these dark yellow squares show the options for where that knight can go, so I'll pick this one. And now it's black's turn, so maybe I'll move this black pawn forward a square. But hold on, there's three dimensions, they're playing on a cube, and there's all these pieces on the bottom side? What is going on? There's this hand that can move like here over the edge. How is it doing this move? How did it do that? What? This hand going up here? What is happening? And there's these Splatoon characters that can also move. What is happening? I programmed chess on the surface of a 3D Rubik's Cube, which results in some pretty crazy results, and let me show you how it works. So in this version, each of the six faces is colored a different color. We have green opposite blue, red opposite orange, and white opposite black. I based this coloring scheme off of real Rubik's cubes, but I replaced yellow with black in my version because in chess, white plays against black. I made this Rubik's cube much larger, which means it doesn't match the standard 3x3 cube, but rather the 7x7 cube, which means there's 49 times 6 equals 294 squares here, which is like triple the standard 64. All right, let me show you how each piece moves, starting with the lowly pawn. Now, in normal chess, the pawn always moves toward the enemy side, but now that there's like no up and no down really, I just have it moving in all four directions orthogonally in one tile, except that it can attack enemy pieces diagonally like this rook. So I could eat this guy like that, but in this instance, this white pawn would not be able to eat this black knight because they're orthogonal. Whenever a piece gets close to the edge of a side like here, it can just choose to go over the edge like that, and now it's on the red side. This means if we take a pawn and put it in a corner like this, it can access three faces at once. It can stay on orange like this, it can move up to white like this, and it can even come onto blue like this. And because of the diagonal capture, it can capture this black queen by moving diagonally over the orange-blue boundary. After the pawn, we have the knight, which behaves just like normal chess. It moves two tiles across and one tile down in any direction, so I can capture this rook that way. But what happens when you get close to the edge? Well, it looks like this. We can go two tiles down and across this way, or two tiles down and across this way to capture this rook, like that. Let's say you're confused about whether A here and B are really a knight's path apart. Just imagine unfolding the net of the cube so it's flat, and then the answer becomes obvious. So from here, the knight could move up to here on the white face, and then from here it only has six options. It can stay on the white face, go to these two options on the green, or these two on the red. So let's just have it go into the red to show you what happens. Pretty cool! Next, we have the bishop, the one that moves diagonally. So it's just like normal chess where the rays keep going until it hits another piece, so a black bishop cannot capture a black knight, but it can capture a white queen. But what's new is that if one of the bishop's rays hits the edge of the side, like here, it sort of refracts over the edge and continues down this green face like this. So this black bishop can capture this white hand, like that. Whoa! So let me undo that, and I want to show you that now that that path is cleared because the hand is gone, that path will actually continue all the way down. So we go from white to green, green to orange, and now it's blocked by, well, a black knight. Take a look at this variant of a Rubik's Cube called a Skube, and notice how it also moves along diagonals that refracts over the edge. When I make a slice like this, notice that that slice goes along all six faces. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and white sides are all affected. There is not one untouched face. Similarly, if we allow the bishop's path to move unobstructed around the cube, so let's get rid of um, this white rook, this white pawn, this white queen, this white knight, this white hand, and that should be it. Then we go up to the original bishop. Okay, so now it hits white, green, orange, black, blue, and red all the way back to home. Well, it, so that means this black bishop is attacking this white queen from both sides. So if I click here, it actually zooms around the long way. Okay, I the way I coded it, I actually don't know which way the animation will pick to attack. Mechanically in the game, it's all the same move, but graphically or cosmetically, it does look quite different whether you go that way or like uh, the, the other way. Okay, I don't know why it's always going the long route, okay? Yeah, I tried to make this as fast as I could, so I'll, uh, that this is an MVP, minimum viable product. It does not have to be perfect. Anyway, moving on to the rook, which I think is pretty basic at this point. You can kind of expect it just goes in orthogonal directions, up, down, left, right. 
and it can go over the edge as well. Um, it can attack, you know, enemies from over the side like that, so goodbye White King. As you can expect, with the Bishop and the Rook explained, we can move on to the Queen, which is just a combination of both. It can either move orthogonally or diagonally like that. And since there's so many options, when you get close to a corner, it's actually quite fascinating to see all the options you have. So let's move this knight out of the way. You just get this huge swath. This queen, mathematically speaking, can move to this blue tile two ways. It can either come down, like, just straight down, like, boop, 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 or it can move diagonally, like, boop, boop. So if I click here, it chooses that one. Um, but I can also move forward through here like that. I think it's really satisfying to see a diagonal piece barely nick a corner like this red side here and go like whoosh, like it's rotating. Isn't that pretty cool? Finally, we have the last of the classic pieces, the king, which is basically like a queen but it's limited to moving only one tile at once. And also, if you lose all your kings, you officially lose the game. Okay, on to the fun new additions. So we have the hand, like this one, which has two options. It can either move like a king, so just one tile at a time, or, well, you might notice that some of the options for movement are way down here. These highlighted yellow tiles are on different faces. So I want you to imagine with a normal 7x7 Rubik's Cube, if you had a tile right here, the one with the logo, imagine like you wanted to send it to this orange spot like this, you're gonna like push it through there like ugh, like that. That's what's happening here with the hand. And so if I click from here to here, it does a slice move, bringing all the pieces on that slice along with it. These white tiles came down to here, the green tiles that were here now move to the bottom, the black tiles that were here moved up to the back, and the seven blue tiles that are on the back now move to the top. And these pieces that have now been revealed can freely interact with this new set of pieces. So these are an interesting set of moves because not only does it transport pieces from one spot to another, but it also changes the color of the tiles underneath. So you can see now this black hand is on a white tile that has no other white tiles around it. Let's do something interesting. This white hand is on the original slice. We can use it to pull back to the original location, and then we can bring the black hand to where it was before. And what we have done in effect is a commutator, which is a sequence of moves in group theory that takes on the form A, B, A backward, B backward, and only the pieces on the intersection of those two slice moves are actually affected in the long term. Take a look at the marked white piece on the real 7x7 Rubik's Cube. We can move it down, right, up, and then back to the left. That takes on the form A, B, A prime, B prime, and only the pieces on the intersection of those two moves end up affected and everything else goes back to normal. Anyway, I thought that was a fun way to introduce a bit of Rubik's Cube group theory to chess, which normally doesn't feature much group theory. But what can the hand do? Well, if we take a standard game, which I sort of put the pieces like this, we can take this white hand here and move it down, and then I'll have black do something useless, like move this pawn up, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what I want to do is put this hand on the same slice as the black king down here. So I can just undo that, I guess. And now this hand can, well, let's see, the king, the black king is right here in the middle. If I pull it up, well, let's take a look. Let's get a good angle of this. Whoa, look at that. Now the black king is exposed. So now look at this. The rook has a clear alleyway to move downward and the black king has been exposed because that white hand pulled it up. If I move the white rook from here down to here, well, that's check, because now this rook can attack the king. Well, in this version, I don't have any code checking for check. It's up to the black player to realize that the white player is only one move away from killing the only king left, so it's up to black to be like, whoa, stop that. And then white can be like, well, I'm gonna attack you anyway, goodbye queen. And then black's like, whoa, now you're up in my face, let me just kill you like that. I have it so that, well, white is opposite black. So if you have a black piece, like say this black queen, it acts normally over almost all colors. But when it hits enemy territory, such as this white tile, it can't go any further. They have to stop their sliding and it must end there, like this. See, this white queen is attacking this black king. Instead of the black king just running away, which is considered a poor move, if you have a hand that's on the right slice, like here, you can just slide black tiles in between the two, and now the white queen cannot even reach the black king. Finally, what are these Splatoon characters doing? Well, just like the hand, they have two possible move options. They can either move like a king, 
so that's one tile in either of the eight directions, or they can move like a Splatoon inkling, where they become one with the ink below and they can travel to any other tile of the same ink color that's connected contiguously. Like imagine this orange paint boundary is like some toxic chemical that this inkling cannot hit, but anywhere that's white is free territory. I want to just get more white tiles at the top if I bring it over here. Now these Splatoon inklings will be super overpowered because they can travel pretty much anywhere in this region. So even if it's blocked by other white pieces or black pieces, the inkling will travel underneath the piece to kind of move where they want to go. Uh, yeah, they don't always take the shortest route to get where they want to go, but you know, that's all cosmetic, it does not matter. Note, this also works if the color of your Splatoon player doesn't exactly match the color of the tiles underneath them. Like this black Splatoon piece can go anywhere in this green contiguous region, like here, and this white Splatoon player can go anywhere in this green region too, like here. It only doesn't work when a Splatoon character is on its opposite color, like this white Splatoon in the black region, then it can't use its Splatoon powers, and it can only travel like a king, like this. Also, Splatoon pieces can't use their inkling-like move to capture pieces, so this white Splatoon piece cannot capture the black king during a Splatoon move because that would be overpowered, but it can move one tile like this, and then capture it like a king. And the reasoning for me adding this piece is because I wanted there to be meaning to the four non-important colors, red, orange, green, and blue. So this feature where sliding pieces like this black queen can't traverse past tiles of the opposite color, like here, is called enemy color mud, and you can turn it off by creating a new custom game. So type four letters into the upper left, YYYY refers to yes take turns, yes go over edges, yes to the enemy color mod feature, and yes to the Rubik's colors. And then put in 0.5 to mean you want a density of 50% of tiles to be randomly filled with pieces. And there you go, a new sandbox game. If you want to remove this enemy mud feature because it's not quite what you want, then just type YYNY to mean no enemy mud, and take a look, white pieces can now travel freely on the black tiles. If you want to create your own board setup like the one I have here, then type some text in this format, where the first four characters are the answers to the first four yes or no questions to the options. This 7x7 seven seven grid of text refers to the placement of pieces on the top face, and the next batch of 7x7 seven seven text refers to the placement of pieces on the bottom face, Copy all of that and paste it into the text box in the upper left and that'll create your board. So if you want to just have like four more queens on the top for no reason, just, you know, alter that, copy paste, put it in, and there you go, four queens are on the top. If you remember the setup I had at the beginning of the video that looked like an original chessboard, well that would be this, where I said no on the fourth option, meaning no Rubik's colors, I wanted the original black and white checkerboard, and the top face has what looks like the standard two rows of pieces on both sides. So feel free to tinker with this sort of text input as much as you want. Let's say I want a whole bunch of alternating rooks in the middle, then that would be capital R, lowercase r, capital R, lowercase r, and so on. And now the middle of this board will be just filled with rooks alternating black and white. And yeah, this was my initial playthrough of Rubik's Chess. It's far from perfect, I just wanted to get it out there as soon as it was functionally playable. Go to hswins.net slash Rubik's Chess if you want to try it out yourself, and have fun! I coded the whole thing with JavaScript, specifically p5.js. It's about a thousand lines of code, and also I got the 3D models from TurboSquid, so thank you so much to that website. Thanks for watching, bye!